All right, well, we're going to get to the Word together, and I'm going to read to you from John 6, verse 5 to 13. This is the Apostle John's version of the feeding of the 5,000. I like this version especially because, as you'll see in a moment, John takes us behind the scenes in a way that the other gospel writers don't. And I'm fascinated as a leader and as a studier of the Bible in the behind the scenes parts of Scripture. And this is certainly that, as you'll see as we read this version of the feeding of the 5,000. He said, when Jesus saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where, not that word, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. How naughty is Jesus? He asked this question only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each to have a bite. Another disciple, Andrew, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small loaves and two small fish, but how far will this go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. So perhaps many more thousands if you include the women and the children. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five loaves left over. The title of this message is called Leftovers, the Miracle of the Discarded. Leftovers, the Miracle of the Discarded. A lot's going on in this passage, as you can tell. A lot of insight that, as I mentioned, others don't give us. Because one of the things that's happening here, beyond the feeding of the hungry people, is that Jesus is using it as an opportunity to grow and to develop these leaders that he's chosen to invest in for a short period of time, for three years. And so before he launches out with his idea, he asks them, do any of you have an idea where we can buy enough food to feed all these people? Now, remember, there hasn't been a miracle of this kind before. There was no precedent set in the minds and experience of the disciples for what was coming next. This was the first miracle of its kind Jesus had ever done. In other words, there's no precedent for this. It's not like they've seen this a few times and know how this goes down. So to ask them, how do we feed all these people? Where do we buy bread for all these people? when they had no idea what was happening next, seems to me to be unfair. But he said this to test them. It seems to me that you can only be tested on something you know. But he's testing on something they clearly have no knowledge of how to answer. Which tells me that if God ever asks you something obvious, something not obvious is going on. So he asked them this to test them because you always know more than you think you know, and God knows that you know more than you think you know. He's not asking them because he knows they have no idea. He's probing for how solution-oriented, how solution-minded. What was the size of the possibility thinking? He's probing the team. He's testing them with this massive idea it's interesting, isn't it, what God considers to be a test of his disciples. He's not testing them with how will you pay the rent this month, which may be for you a huge test. But he's testing them with something so crazy, so wild, so outside of anybody's reference point and considers that a test. I think sometimes we need to lift our game in what we think we can really call a test in our Christianity. And he tests them at this high level, getting them to reach inside with a thinking and a suggestion and an idea that may just get into the neighborhood of where Jesus is. 
Well, Philip is the first one to speak up, and Philip represents the logistical people in the team. They always have a place in the team. They should usually never be in charge. Philip's are the details, the, the logical people, the, you know, the, the figuring it out, giving you all the reasons why a thing can't be done. So Philip says, Jesus, leave it to me. I've done the math. I'm ahead of the game. Eight months' wages will not fix this, as if Jesus would be so proud of him coming up with an economical answer to a non-economical question. And he says, I've figured it out, Jesus. And Jesus listens to that. And as he's just spoken, then Andrew chips in his contribution. Now, in life, I think we are either going to be Philip's or Andrew's when we get around the things of God and get around how God ticks and how God works, you're going to be a Philip where you think logistically and practically and in a detailed way and whether it can be done or not, what's doable or not, or you are an Andrew. Andrews are glass half full people. Andrew says, well, here's a boy with a small pack lunch. And then he says, I suppose in a tone of voice that let Jesus know, you know, I, I know this can't feed all these people. So he said, but how far will this go amongst so many? So he offers the idea. He knows that what he's suggesting isn't enough. So he adds that little comment at the end. But how far will so little go amongst so many? Him not knowing that his suggestion is in the neighborhood of something that's the beginning of a possibility. Because when Jesus said, where shall we buy, he had no intention of buying anything. He used the word buy to see whether or not they would answer him literally, which Philip did, or whether they would hear that as just one idea, and amongst his leadership team, they would come up with other ideas. And this is what great leaders do all the time, by the way, and great parents, and great fathers, and great teachers and mentors, they are willing to appear stuck. They're willing to appear to not have an answer to leave room for you to come up with your answer. Jesus intentionally appeared like he didn't know what to do. We know from John's comment he knew what to do, but he allowed room for them to come up with what they wanted to do. If you're a leader or a parent or a teacher or a coach or a mentor or a pastor, if you're always the one to tell us what you think should be done, we're all going to just fall in line with your ideas all the time, which means none of us grow. Develop the skill with your children, with those that you are growing and helping and investing in. Develop the skill of learning to say nothing just to give room for someone else to say something. That's how leaders and children and those that are being developed and mentored by us in all realms of life, that's how we grow. Leave space for them to grow is what Jesus is doing here. And so Andrew comes up with this second idea and Jesus said, let's, let's go with that idea. And by the way, we still don't know to this day what Jesus' idea was. Because the loaves and fishes was not his idea. It was Andrew's idea. So we still have no idea what Jesus had in mind. When John tells us he had in mind what he was going to do, we don't know what that was because Andrew came up with an idea and Jesus said, cool, let's go with that. So we don't know what he had in mind, but what we do know is he took hold of Andrew's suggestion, Andrew's weak, um, you know, insecure offering because he didn't know whether or not he's in the right area of thinking. Jesus said, let's go with that. What I find fascinating as well about this passage is that Jesus said, feed them all until they've had as much as they want. Then he gives them a very careful instruction. He said, make sure when they've all done, you guys go around and collect everything that's left over. I want to collect the leftovers. He said, let nothing be wasted. Isn't it strange that that if Jesus can multiply bed, bread with no limitation, if he's able to multiply anything with no limitation, why would you be concerned about leftovers? If you, can just, if you can just create bread through your hands, if you can multiply and increase anything, in this case bread, why would you be concerned about leftovers? Because if you can multiply bread, we'll never be short of bread. If we need more, just create more is maybe what they were thinking in their minds. Maybe they were thinking, Jesus, why are we even concerned about leftovers? You are the miracle worker. You can just produce bread from thin air, as it were, because this has clearly got to be a lesson 
to them and to us that God is very interested and God is very particular and intentional about leftovers. Leftovers is for those that were not there at the first sitting. Leftovers is for those that were not amongst the 5,000 that got the meal served to them firsthand. And the moment Jesus began to break bread for those that were there, in his mind were those that were not there. In his mind, he wasn't just feeding the people that made it to the service, that made it to the miracle, that made it to that moment. In his mind, he was thinking of those that couldn't make it, those that were still at home, those that were still hungry. And so he intentionally, I think, kept producing more than they needed and made sure that what they didn't want was gathered. Because I want you to understand that there is a miracle for someone else in what you don't want. There's a miracle for someone else in what you have too much of. There's a miracle for someone else in what you don't need or what you don't like or what you can't use. There's a miracle in our leftovers. There's a miracle in the things that we discard. And I want this message to make you much more aware of waste in our lives. There's a lot of waste in Christianity. There's a lot of waste, I think, amongst us in the church. There's a lot of waste in the world. I was reading recently, statistically, just a fraction of what the world throws away in food every single year would feed something like 870 million people. I think a quarter of what the world throw away every year would feed a population larger, larger than Europe. There's so much waste naturally in the world. When I was growing up as a kid in a family of eight, leftovers was the name of a meal in my house. In our house with, with six kids and mom and dad, there was no such thing as, as us wasting anything. What we didn't eat at that sitting was always kept and served again for the next day and the next day. In fact, my mother made the kind of meals that would last several days and it didn't matter that we had had it the day before and the day before. We didn't be ungrateful because we were just glad we had food and leftovers was the name of a meal that we regularly had. My mother was a genius at making something out of nothing. It was like, it was like her own miracle with the five loaves and two fishes. How far she made food go amongst so many. I remember growing up even in our home, you know, back then uh, when I was born and the home I lived in, our family were very poor. You don't know you're poor when you're a kid because all your friends are poor too. So you think everybody's like you. And we were very poor, I realized looking back. We used to get bathed in a bath once a week, a bath, in a big tin bath. We had no indoor plumbing. We didn't have indoor taps in a bathroom. And so we got bathed in a big tin bath. And the bath was filled with water and all of us went in the same water. My dad went in first, not because not it was Father's Day, <laughs> every day. My dad went in first, and my dad was a coal miner. Imagine the color of the water when he got out. So the last child in came out dirtier than when they started, <laughs> because the last child was bathing in water that really would have been outlawed by health and safety. But it was recycling the water. Everything was used and reused because we knew that we didn't have much and so we made much out of the little that we did have. I remember once going to a friend's house from school. And all of my friends, when we left the school gates, turned right to go to where we lived on what are called council estates in our country, usually where the poor, many of the poor in our country live in these council houses, these council homes. And that's where we lived on one of the worst council estates in our community. But on this particular occasion, I went out of the school gates and turned left, where the posh people lived. Went to my friend's house, and I'd never been that part of town before, never been to his neighborhood, and I began to notice things that I shouldn't notice, but I noticed them because they were not present in my house. One of the first things I noticed was that 
in their house, they had carpet that went all the way to the walls. In our house, we had a little rug in the middle, and the rest of the floor was, we called it linoleum. What do you call it here? Like a, like a sort of, like a sort of um, linoleum plastic flooring that kind of covered the rest of the floor because it was much cheaper than carpet, much more durable. So we had a bit of carpet. So all my life, I never knew that you could buy carpet that went to the walls. My mother never told me that. I noticed they had carpet that went to the walls. I thought, this is interesting. I must tell my mother about this, not knowing she knew and she'd been holding out on us. Then I remember my friends, I said to my friend, I need to go to the bathroom and I set out to the front door because our bathroom, our toilet was outside. We had outside toilets and we used to go down the, down the road, across the path to the back garden where there were outside toilets and my friend said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the bathroom. He said, no, it's upstairs. I'm like, oh, that's gross. <laughs> Why would you have a bathroom in? I'd never been to an indoor toilet in my life. And so I went upstairs and saw this bathroom. I was fascinated that people had toilets inside their homes. I thought, I must tell my mother. <laughs> Not knowing she knew and had never told us how the other half lived. I went into the bathroom. I know I was in there a long time. I came downstairs soaking wet. And my friend said to me, why are you so wet? And I said, because I decided to have a drink from that drinking fountain. It was called a B-Day. <laughs> but I'd never seen one. I'd only ever seen something like that in the park where people drink from. I, I thought, this is, really, this, is really, this is really a posh house because they have a drinking fountain in their bathroom. I must tell my mother about those too. I got so wet trying to get the water into my mouth from the drinking fountain. So this was a massive shock to my experience as a child, as a human being, because in our house, none of this stuff was spoken about, seemingly known about. My experience was just, my, my experience was just so in shock mode. I, I remember looking at the house and the room, and on the wall, they had proper pictures. In our house, we couldn't afford pictures on the wall. In our house, we had chocolate box lids. When my mother occasionally was bought a box of chocolates by my father, she would keep the box and she would hang the box on the wall because the, 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 the Cadbury's milk tray boxes back then had artistic images on the box lid. So my mother would keep the box, put it on the wall like it was a painting. I thought Cadbury's was an artist till I was about 15. These people are the real thing. And so seeing how the other half lived and understanding that we conserved everything, we recycled everything, we were careful with everything. Waste was outlawed in our home. Waste was something we associated with people that didn't care about throwing things away. We had nothing disposable in our house. We were into recycling before recycling was trendy. It occurs to me, pastoring for over 30 years, and now doing what I do like I am with you guys around the world, that there is still a lot of waste in the church. What I mean by that is I was in a church recently and on the screen were a list of prayer requests. In some churches around the world, they do prayer requests and praise reports in the service, and that's a good thing to do where you would send in on a piece of paper your needs of prayer, and you'd send in your praise reports of where God has blessed you, you've had an answer, had a breakthrough, they will be read out too. I noticed particularly this time, not that it was unusual, but I thought this time because of this message I was thinking about preparing that the prayer request struck me as being things that really should not take the time of hundreds of people in the room. That the prayer request list, it struck me, was hardly worthy of being called something we should all get into praying about. Because the first thing on the list was um, somebody had toothache. I know toothache's not nice, toothache's not pleasant. But I don't think it's something I would want to ask you all to pray for me about. The next thing was someone wanted a girlfriend. Well, I've got to tell you, prayer will not help you with that. 
Maybe deodorant will. <laughs> Hashtag just saying. <laughs> Another one on there was prayer to pass a driving test. Prayer will not help you with passing a driving test. You can either drive or you can't. <laughs> do you think that the Holy Spirit is going to do a Jedi move on the driving instructor? You have passed your test. <laughs> you have passed your test. Do, do, do we think that God is, going to, God is going to supersede and compensate for your lack of study and you just pass the exam? Or suddenly you can just drive, it's a miracle, when we know you can't drive. We don't want you on the road if God helped you pass your test. We want you to pass it by yourself with no supernatural help at all. On the screen there was things like, oh, I want prayer for a job interview to go well, or a good week in school, or the new baby to sleep at night. I want prayer to give up cigarettes, or I want prayer for a new friend, or settle in a new job. Now, these things, I suppose, matter, but to put them on a screen to ask all of us to pray, and in the same church service, I noticed as people began to pray for each other, a lady close by to me asked for prayer, and when someone said to her, what do you need prayer for? She said, I have a headache. And seven people laid hands on one lady with a headache. People, this is overkill. It is wasteful. It struck me that we are so pampered, that we are so loved, and we are so cared for, and we are so supported, and we are so encouraged, and we are so included, and we are so accepted. Do you know, if you could take even a fraction of the banquet that is being served of the grace and the joy and the love and the faith and the encouragement and the empathy and the compassion, if you could take even a crumb from this banquet table and throw it in the direction of someone not here tonight, if you could take the leftovers of what you don't need for you tonight and give it to someone else that was once you and once me, we were once the ones that were not at the first sitting. We were once the ones that hoped there'd be leftovers. Remember the woman that came, the Gentile woman, she asked Jesus for prayer for her daughter and Jesus said, is it right that I would take the bread of the children of the, of the Jews that he first came to reach? Is it right, he said, that I would take the bread of God's people, of the Jews, and give it to you, a Gentile, an outsider? And she said, I would be glad, Jesus. And he said, he said, would I take the children's bread, give it to a dog? So he implies that she's a dog coming begging for crumbs from the table that they're feeding from as the Jews. And she said to Jesus, Jesus, I don't mind being called a dog. Woof, woof. I'm happy to be a dog. All I want is a crumb from the table of what you give them. All I want is some leftovers. If you will give me a crumb from the banquet that they have and don't need, I will go away happy, is what she said to him. And I want you to understand, City Harvest, that, that I want you to be more intentional and more aware of how much you consume on you that's beyond what you need for you. How much love, after all, do you need? How much grace, after all, do you need? How much mercy and forgiveness, and compassion, and encouragement. How much after all do you need? Because I think after you've eaten all you want, Jesus said, give them what they want. After they've eaten what they want, after you've eaten what you want, what you don't want is not to be thrown away. What you don't want is for someone else. What you don't want is leftovers. And God, God is the God of the leftovers. God specializes in discarded things. We need to get intentional about recycled blessing. What you can't use, recycle it. Don't, don't warehouse it. Don't keep it till it goes off. There's a bad smell in many churches. There's a bad smell in many believers' lives because we're warehousing stuff that went off. 
Rather than give it away to someone that we'd be glad for a fraction of it, we warehouse it. We become overfed and under-exercised spiritually. But if you will leave here tonight being more otherly minded than ever, then I think you're going to get aware in these coming days and weeks in the second half of 2018, in this second half, I wonder if one of the characterizing words of the second half of this year can be leftovers. What if you will think every day, I, I, I don't need another text telling me how much I'm loved. I've had five or six today. I think the last four texts would have made a massive difference to a friend I know at work who would think they'd died and gone to heaven for one text like that. But instead, we text the people that we already text because you told someone you have a problem, and though we are concerned and it's okay that you have a problem. You know, the Bible said God knows the hairs and has counted the hairs on your head, which means there's a lot of things you don't need, you don't need to mention to him because God's counting. He knows. He's involved. He's tracking with you. And I realized in our church towards the late 90s that our church had sat down to this banquet that was being poured in our church. And 20 years on, we were so blessed and so full, and we were so living in the fullness of that. And though our services were filled with language of reaching others, we weren't reaching others. Our service, the lyrics of our songs, and the language of our preaching sounded like we were reaching the world, but the truth is we weren't really reaching anybody because no one knew was coming to our church and no one that came looked different to those that were there anyway. And whenever a church reaches people that just are like the people already in the church, when we reach people just like us, it tells you the church's circle of love is driven by comfort, not compassion. There are many, many people out there in this country, in this community, as there are in all our communities that are not like the people already gathered. And Jesus is interested in the discarded people. God is looking for the leftover people. And in the late 90s, when I started a new church inside the old church, half of the people that were the 5,000 at the banquet, if you like, half of them left. And I began to reach the poor in our city. And I began to bus in hundreds of these people who never believed that God, let alone a church, would look in their direction. And I began from ground zero, starting again, building a church from what the world would call leftover, discarded people. There is a miracle in what the world and society do not want. There is a miracle in people just outside of your peripheral vision, there is a miracle. Remember the, remember the, the, the teaching about the, the banquet? And Jesus tells a story of a man that threw a banquet and then he sent out his staff to the invited guests to tell the invited guests, it's now ready, the party is ready, the banquet's ready, now's the time to come. And Jesus said the invited guests one by one sent a reason why they couldn't be there. And they said, well, I'd love to come, but I'm really busy involved at work. One of them said, I just got married and, you know, I, I can't really be away right now. And one of them said, I'm involved in, you know, some business transaction. And they sent their excuses. And, and, and the staff came back and said to the master, we went to all the invited people. We went to all the full people. We went to all the people on the invite list who are always the ones that get invited. We went to them, and they all said they're too busy, can't be bothered, too much going on in their lives. They're too full. And instead of canceling the party, instead of canceling the banquet, the master, a picture of God, said to them, then forget these overfed people. Forget these full people. Go to the people that never dreamed they'd be included. Go to the discarded people. Go to the leftover people. And so they went out and started to bring in those that never thought they'd be included. And they came back and they said to the master, we've spent all day including people that no one includes, loving people that no one loves, inviting people no church ever invites. We spent all day doing it. And they said to the master, but there's still room. And so he said, then go again. This time go wider. Fling your circle of love wider. 
and go and find people in the highways and byways and include people who never dreamed they'd be included. He said, go to the poor and go to the blind and go to the lame and go to those that have nothing and go to those that would never qualify to be on anybody's invite list. That was once you and once me. And he said, because my house must be full. God doesn't care who his house is full with. He just wants it full. Sometimes we want to control who the house is full with. Sometimes, and this was the problem in our church and many around the world, sometimes we want to decide who it is that comes to our church because we want to keep it like a social club where we feel comfortable with people like us. And I understand that we feel comfortable with people like us. Nothing wrong with that unless it becomes inward and exclusive of others. And if you could cut God, he would bleed. His blood type is all positive. Others. God's blood type is others. If you cut the church, we often bleed ourselves. But we have a theology of others, but our lifestyles often out about us. We sang that song, didn't we? About, we're sorry what we've made worship about. We've made a lot of things, by the way, about us that were never supposed to be about us. Because love is not about us. I have a whole other message that I teach around the world now because this is where our church got stuck. That love is not a gift. Love is a baton. You know, a relay baton? Love isn't a gift that I keep and it stays with me. Love is a baton to be passed on. Love goes off when you keep it. It stays fresh when you pass it on. So we've made love about us. We've made grace about us. We've made, we've made encouragement about us. We've made worship about us. There are many things that we've made about us. And you know what? You cannot say it's all about you, Jesus, and not understand that if worship is all about him, you can't worship him and not still worship and adore the things he cares about. You can't love Jesus and not love what he loves. You can't make him your personal God and say, well, I love him in my way, but I don't include and I don't like and I don't love people like that because this was our church. And I wanted the reality to dawn for our church that I don't want to build a church where we, where we believe that every time we gather and our Christianity and our relationships are about us getting more on top of the more we've already got. Some of you are so blessed you can hardly stand it. And I figured something out about God. God is not drawn to full things. God is not drawn to full people. God is not drawn to full churches. God is drawn to emptiness. If you stop finding empty people, if you stop finding empty places, if you stop finding empty lives, God loses interest in us. Because though the 99 are gathered in, where's Jesus? He's left the 99 because he considers we gathered in. He's always leaving the 99. He's always leaving the majority. Statistically, it makes no sense. A shepherd that leaves the majority for the minority makes no sense. It sounds like bad shepherding to me. Until you understand the heart of the shepherd is always for the ones that were not there. It's always for the discarded people, the non-included people, the unacceptable people, the outsiders, those that were in the highways and byways. It's always about them. And when any of our churches think it's about us, when we think that the church exists for us, we, we're glad you're here. Every church pastor and leader we're glad that you're here, is glad for who's there. But sometimes pastors get into a habit of leading churches and, and give themselves too much to the people that come and forget that we're not equipping you and growing you so that you can just get fatter. That we, we're giving you and we're equipping you and we're growing you so that you can give stuff away. The idea is to live full but die empty. 
Not live full, stay full, protect your fullness, get fuller and fuller and fuller until you're bursting. Because what this breeds is people who, who call a thing a problem that's really not a problem. To ask a church to pray for you to pass a driving test, I'm thinking, okay, something's wrong with the church around the world. Do we think that's a valid prayer request? Because on the same screen in one church, I saw, pray for me, I've been diagnosed with cancer. That's a problem. But it's right there next to toothache. And I'm thinking, someone needs to edit this stuff and re-educate us as to what really is a need that's worthy of all our time and attention. Because, and I'm sorry if you've got toothache, but take a painkiller. Is my point. And let's, let's fix the things we can fix. Let's involve in the things we can change and then the things we can't change and can't fix, the big things that the world are dealing with. Let's get involved in the big things the world are dealing with because all the big things in the world, I promise you, is where the Holy Spirit is wondering, when will the church show up? Because when our church started to reach the poor and we drove our vehicle into the red light district, when we took our church vehicle into the red light district to reach the prostitutes, the first thing I noticed was our vehicle was not in a queue behind other churches' vehicles. There's no competition from churches for those people. The competition in churches is stealing each other's people. But our vehicle, our church vehicle, should have been in a long line, shouldn't it, behind every other church's vehicle. But all the churches in the city, none of them were reaching these people in the red light district. None of them were feeding the poor and the homeless. When we got there, there was no other churches around. And yet every single church in the city was praying for the city. Every church in the city was probably crying over the lost. But none of them were going to where the lost were. They were all enjoying the banquet and getting fuller and fuller. And we have to stop building Christianity and lives where we think that that is how God intends us to live our lives. I want you to live the second half for someone else. Maybe the reason that the first half of this year has not been great is because you are too fat. You are dying of clogged arteries because you are overfed. You're too blessed. You're too loved. You're too encouraged. You're too included. You got too many messages coming every day telling you how loved you are. Tell the people that tell you that, stop it. Don't anybody else tell me how loved I am. I'm sick of hearing it. It's time for me to stop making you think I need that. Some of you, some of you, I gotta finish. I know, I've no time for your clapping, but I do like it. Some of you, we love you, you're our friend, but you're high maintenance. Uh, just ever, everybody look straight at me right now. Don't be, he's talking about you. You're high maintenance and you're killing us. You're wearing us out. Because we tell you more than anybody else in our world how much we love you, we love you, we love you. And then you're still depressed and fed up and miserable and discouraged even though we're showering you with love. And the problem isn't that you need more love. The problem is you need to go on a diet. You need to have a love diet. You're getting too much love. You don't need all that love. You don't need that much love. You need to start giving love away. Start helping and serving someone else. Because, because you, you, you are a walking leftover mountain. Some of you have massive stockpiles, warehouses full of stuff you can use in a thousand lifetimes. You gotta start giving this stuff away. And I promise you this, the second half of this year will be completely different. I mean, in a revolutionary way, completely different if you will commit now here to leave this building and start to give stuff away instead of hoarding it and warehousing it. I have come, I have come to be your 
decluttering coach. <laughs> Declutter your life of all the stuff you don't need, but you're keeping it anyway. There is a miracle in the discarded things. There is a miracle in what you don't need. And please, would you try in the second half to stop asking God for stuff you can sort out yourselves. Stop asking God for silly stuff. Lord, help me just to, help me just to, you know, uh, get a job or pass my test or like the things I saw or help me just to feel more loved or, and I'm like, really, really? Really? Do you think, I think some of us think that God is the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Where the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion went to ask for courage and for a heart and for brains. Not knowing that to find the courage and the heart and the brains they did not need a wizard, they needed a witch. Because the witch brought out the courage in them. And the witch brought out the brains in the scarecrow. And the witch brought out the courage in the lion. Remember the lion? I fight you with one hand, I fight you with two. Forget it, it was wasted on you all. <laughs> it's a generation that don't know what I'm talking about. Wizard of Oz, go home. Rent it on Netflix. It'll change your life. Seriously. And that's what I think we're building churches where we, we give the impression that God is the wizard of Oz. That what we do is we come and ask him for things you already have. Just give me courage, Lord. No, you need a problem. You need a problem. You don't need God to give you courage. You have courage. The problem is your life is too nice for you to use it. So God's not going to send you courage. He's going to send you trouble. And the trouble will bring out the courage in you. Lord, help me. Lord, uh, Lord, give me, give me, Lord, give me a heart. Give me a heart of worship. Give me a heart of love. No, you already got one. God's going to send you stuff that makes you more worshipful, that makes you more adoring of him. God's going to send you problems and witches to get out of you the brilliance and the genius and the strength and the love and the grace that kindness and friendship often doesn't bring out of you because friends create comfort, but enemies create movement. I got so sick of the prayer meetings in our church because we had prayer meetings about stuff we had no intention of changing. We prayed for the lost and Shabbat Abadud for the lost. We prayed, we prayed. We called them from north, south, east, and west. We bound and we, we bound the demons and we did all that. And we did all of that and nothing changed. And we did it every single week for years. And I said, we should stop praying about things we have no intention of doing. Let's start reaching the poor. Let's get in trouble. Let's get our church in trouble. Let's go. Let's go. I gotta finish. Let's go and reach people that scare us to death. Let's go and find people that scare the hell out of us. Let's go find those people. And when we started reaching these people, you should have heard our prayer meetings. People came to prayer meetings that never came because they were so terrified of coming and sitting next to a prostitute. That'll make you pray. They were terrified of bumping into a drug dealer in the foyer in our church. So they'd come praying and praying and praying because the church wasn't safe anymore. Because I was filling our church with discarded people. I was looking in our city for leftover people. People nobody wants, including churches. No churches wanted these people. No church wanted some of you. No church wants thousands of people out there in Singapore tonight. No church wants them. And what the word on the street needs to be about City Harvest, the word on the street should be, you wouldn't believe who goes to that church. You wouldn't believe who goes to that church, meaning you accept all kinds of people other churches don't. What a compliment that would be. What an honor that would be to have that said about us. Come on, time's gone. Let's stand together. Let's get the band back up here.